Mufret. Oxide primer is red. My t-shirt is blue. I'm stoked for this model. And so should be you. Let's check it out. So, this is a model I've had in the stash for a while, and keeping up with this year's spirit of trying something slightly different each time, I think it's the best opportunity to build a factory fresh tank that's still coated with oxide primer. It's a pretty well documented vehicle of the last produced Ferdinand, and my first experience with amusing hobby. So my hopes are pretty high. Especially when it comes to the decals, because they will cover roughly half of the entire model. I also found some extra blink in the stash, such as these 3D printed tracks from Panzerwerk, which sadly won't fit on the model, and a resin and metal gun barrel from Panzer Art. Let's get this show on the road. After a quick assembly of some of the major components of the hull, I wanted to focus on the initial fun techniques. The bolt beads on the model look fairly okay for the most part, although some are very shallow. And even though the quality is getting better, I still can't get over that tidy and perfect look. Besides, in some cases, such as here in the back, the armor plates don't line up perfectly and this visible gap makes no sense. Thus, once it comes down to slicing and chopping, I immediately bring out my chisels and rescribe the entire model. And there's something comforting about working on a German subject in this manner, because although the interlocking plates might seem intimidating, pretty much every kit ever produced has the weld beads sunken under the surface. Which means, we can simply use them as a guide for the chisel, and the job suddenly becomes quick and painless. Of course, things get more serious if the weld line isn't clearly defined, but here we can use a hobby blade or a razor saw to score out the initial lines and then use them as a guide for the chisel. Here I was actually able to simulate how the rear plates were additionally welded to the hull of a Porsche Tiger, which is a nice touch. That actually didn't take too long at all, and although it doesn't make the model look nicer, it's a foundation for the upcoming work. Not to mention, I was able to add weld lines on the lower back plate, which weren't even present in the kit. Next up, although each plate has a decently sculpted texture, I'm gonna enhance it with my traditional method of stippling with Tamiya putty diluted with modeling cement. I think it's hands down the best upgrade you can do to any armor model, especially if it has no steel texture at all. Even on a light tank, where you have to be very subtle with the texture, and let's say reference photos show that the real vehicle was completely smooth, there's something very appealing about those barely visible imperfections on the surface. Not to mention how it completely transforms the model and your painting experience, including the final paint job. But this is one of the heaviest tanks Germany ever produced in World War II, so I wasn't too concerned about the smoothness of the finish. Once that was out of the way, I grabbed a hobby blade and added flame cut marks on the steel plate cross sections. Here it's worth noting that the real Ferdinands and Elephants seem to have their plates machined after cutting, and that results in quite smooth looking cuts. This is one of the areas where I'm willing to knowingly bend the reality and go against my references, because this method is simply a part of the whole package for me. Especially when I'm trying to convey a 65 ton steel monster, and especially when I'm painting it in a factory finish, where my painting and weathering possibilities are quite limited. In other words, I was going to squeeze as much texture and visual candy out of this model as possible. The final step in this process is sculpting new weld beads. For this, Tamiya Epoxy Putty is my favorite medium, even though I tried different types in the past, but I still find myself going back to this one. It needs to be rolled into thin noodles, but you'll find that on these giant German tanks, the welds can be actually pretty thick. Check out how here I made the noodle thinner than it had to be, and I have problems filling the groove with it. It's not the end of the world, I just had to add more putty in selected areas and everything was good. The putty is called quick type for a reason, and it's because the working time is quite limited. Maybe an hour before it starts losing its properties. 
As such, I like to start by filling as many weld lines as I possibly can before I start noticing that the putty is not so sticky anymore. And then I start adding the texture. For this, I have made several tools, but I mostly keep using two. This flat headed screwdriver thingy, which I carved out of a leftover sprue and made the flat end pretty sharp. And this tool is excellent for those messy multiple pass welds that are stacked on top of each other. The other one is a piece of soda can bent into a half pipe wrapped around a toothpick, which is great for the tidier looking single bevel welds. You have to check reference images to see what type of vault is used on each part of the real vehicle and walkarounds shot at armor museums are the best source of that information. Sometimes you can find pretty interesting details in there such as on this massive interlocking joint on the superstructure where two single bevel welds are crammed into each other. So that about sums up the basic improvements I've made to the kit. If you glued those kit parts together and left them untouched, the difference would be quite noticeable. And that's why I like to play around with the model for a while like this, even if it's the most basic out of the box build. In other news, the running gear on this model is functional, but also quite sketchy as it wobbles all over the place. The Panzer Art barrel fits mostly without issues, but it's slightly thicker than the kit part and it doesn't fit in the travel lock. I also spent some time with other details that had to be textured and welded in place. Panzerberg sent me a set of elephant tracks as a gift in the past without knowing about this model, but it was only when I started building it that I realized elephant and Ferdinand tracks looked different. So I quickly ordered a set of Freel model ones because I knew it would be easier to achieve a convincing rusty finish on them. I haven't worked with these in quite a long while, but my procedure didn't change. I ditched the provided brass wire and used copper instead, which is much easier to chop into the exact length. I made a simple chopping jig from scrap styrene for the job, and thanks to that, the wires will sit flush with the track links. Now, Freel model tracks often need to be drilled out because the holes are not cast perfectly, but on this set, I found that a bit of brute force solved the issue. With a combination of tweezers and large pliers, I could carefully push the wire through the holes without even touching the drill bit. It wasn't as enjoyable as assembling Master Club tracks or a set of 3D printed ones, but hey, it got the job done and the result is tracks that are pretty much indestructible. They add a bit of weight to the model, which always feels nice, and they hold the wobbly running gear together. After that, I was left with some odd tasks here and there, such as drilling out and replacing the electric cable sockets in the armor, which I made from a hollowed out plastic rod. Also, these rods are present on the real tank, they're drawn in the instructions, but they're missing on the actual parts. That's pretty strange, but okay. All the plastic grab handles were replaced with wires, held in place with VMS black super glue, and the excess was wiped away with their debonder, turning a messy super gluing job into a perfectly clean finish. Lastly, I replaced the beautiful metal barrel with the original plastic part, which will fit much better in the travel lock. So that's most of the build finished, and all that's left to do is photo etch. While I was ordering the metal tracks, I noticed a set of cheap Edward photo etch for this model, so I quickly tossed it into the shopping cart. Because hey, a few photo etched clamps and whatnot can improve every model. It also came with metal mudguards, and although a factory fresh tank is definitely not gonna show any signs of battle damage on those, I thought, why not? They're still gonna look more authentic and detailed than the plastic ones. Fenders are usually ideal candidates for soldering because they're built up from various parts and they need to be held together really strong. But these are actually pretty simple and if you follow the instructions, they can be safely assembled with nothing but super glue. However, when I was looking at the reference images, here we can see clearly that the mudguard is bent in an interesting way. So even a brand new tank could have some imperfections. And we're talking here about German quality. 
The smaller bits and pieces were also useful, and the gun cleaning tube was just easier to replace with an evergreen profile. But interestingly, Edward completely ignored those towing cable hooks. I can see why though, because in real life they were quite thick, and photo edge is not an ideal replacement, but they definitely were not as thick as the plastic parts. So the sweet spot lies somewhere in between. Well, I simply fabricated them from the photo edge sprue, so there's that, my pretty improvised solution to the problem. And that actually wraps up the construction of this model. I found it to be a great subject for a straightforward summer build, because, you know, this time of the year I like to spend more time outside, ride my bikes or chill out in the garden, and a model that isn't overly complex is just the perfect thing for such an occasion. But I did find the quality of the kit to be quite lacking in places, especially when it came to the smaller parts which were a bit simplified, parts of them were missing, or the overall execution was just too rough. But we've got all of that out of the way, so you know what? Let's paint this thing. The obligatory first task, priming. And because we have a fair bit of large photo edge on the model, I started by spraying VMS metal prep on these surfaces. Then I unified the entire model with a standard light gray Mr. Surfacer and Yep, it's an odd choice, I know, because most of the time I either prime my models black or dark brown, but this time it's gonna work perfectly with the upcoming painting method. You see, I'm one of the biggest fans of post shading and that's exactly what I'm going to do with this primer. Post shade it, or in a less elusive language, pre-shade the model. More specifically, I'm using the so-called black and white method developed and popularized by Jose Luis Lopez. The first step is to quickly outline every detail and surface feature. This will help you get familiar with the model's shape and features, and you'll develop some initial ideas about what can be done with the surface. But it's not just that, we can also introduce some initial gradients on the lower edges of large panels, paint the completely shadowed lower hull, add basic initial streaking effects on the sides, and so on. My airbrush work here wasn't the smoothest because opacity was my main objective, and I wasn't worried about the airbrush sputtering because the upcoming layers are gonna smoothen things out. The second layer is mixed from 8 parts white and 2 parts black, acting as a middle ground for this undercoat. It nicely smoothens out the previous layer and can be used to fix mistakes or make the contrast less obvious in the most highlighted areas. The final several layers are sprayed with pure white. I'm saying several because the paint has to be so drastically diluted that we can't achieve good opacity without going over the same spot multiple times. This ensures smooth spraying without sputtering and also gives us maximum control over the effect. I'm using the new lacquer AK Real Color paints for this, and even though they seem reasonably thinned from the factory, they're still pretty opaque, so you'll definitely have to dilute them further with leveling thinner. When you think about it, it's the same method as zenithal pre-shading for figures, just adapted to armor models and expanded upon with all these streaks, forced contrasts, and so on. Jose has a detailed tutorial on his website where he shows how the method can be pushed even further by painting the small details with a brush, adding a black pin wash, creating initial chips with white, stains of dirt with black, and so on. I decided to keep it simple by just picking out the smallest details because I was going to add the other techniques after the model was painted, and I just didn't want to apply them twice. So this is the result, and it's also worth noting that with this method, you'll spend the majority of your time messing around with white and black. This model for example took me 8 hours to pre-shade, and only 30 minutes to apply the actual base color. Speaking of which, I used Adam Wilder's recipe for oxide primer, but added a ton of gloss varnish into it. The actual paints used here were 8 parts flat red, 1 part flat brown, and 1 part deck tan. You can make it even lighter if you want to. The gloss varnish makes the paint more translucent, but of course, I had to dilute it with lacquer thinner as well. The glossy finish feels very unnatural because it's supposed to be a completely flat oxide primer, but we'll get to that in a moment. 
Besides, it makes a beautiful foundation for the decals and there will be a lot of them. I also found that it's better to cover the entire model in two or three light coats and then take a good look at it and only then start adding more paint in selected areas where the paint coverage isn't sufficient or it looks unnaturally desaturated. It was especially noticeable on the wheels where the dark yellow came out, not so great. If I were to do it again, I'd simply add a drop or two of flat yellow to make it overly saturated and once applied over the pre-shading, the final result would look just right. So that's the black and white pre-shading in action. We could tweak it even further with post-shading, but that would completely defeat the purpose of the black and white in my opinion. So let's push on and build upon what we already have. This is the first time I'm using a wet palette for the decals because some of them are quite large. My experience with the assembly of this model made me worried about their quality because poor decals in this amount would absolutely ruin the entire model. Well, my fears were not justified because the decals are absolutely spot on perfect. Not only I found that all the writing and pictures on the tank are replicated faithfully, but the decal carrier film is extremely thin and becomes invisible once everything is done. I didn't even have to use too much chemistry here. I just placed each decal in the correct position, left the water to evaporate and then brushed the VMS decal softener on top of it. The softener did its work without any extra effort. I didn't have to stipple the decal or anything like that. It was also the first time in many years when I made one of the most obvious mistakes with decals. A couple of them had air bubbles trapped underneath, but luckily all the upcoming effects have completely covered them up. With all of them spent, just check out how well they settled into the textured steel surface. Next up was the obvious task spraying the oxide surface with VMS flat varnish. You might have noticed that I used several of their products on this model, such as the black superglue, debonder, decal softener and varnishes. So if you'd like to try them out as well, I have good news for you. If you buy directly from VMS or if you're in the US and you're shopping with Michigan Toy Soldier, you can use the sales coupons that you'll find in the video description for a small discount on your order and in return you'll help me out. I'm absolutely blown away by this result. Not just the decals, but the pre-shaded oxide primer as well. The flat varnish gives it a very realistic look and the decals are… well, you'd have a hard time distinguishing them from dry transfers. But even though we have done a lot in terms of painting and the model already looks pretty interesting for a factory fresh finish, there are several methods that can make it look even more interesting and authentic. The first obvious and at the same time speculative technique is a pin wash. Now, why would I question the legitimacy of one of the most powerful techniques ever? Well, the thing is, the pre-shading on this model was so effective that I briefly considered keeping the wash at bay and focusing it only on the most flat looking details. It's also the reason why I didn't apply a black wash on the pre-shaded model because then I'd just be applying the same method twice. But as I was working on it, I also thought that a black wash might actually do such a good job that the actual wash on top of the finished base coat might be totally unnecessary. It's hard to be certain about it without trying it out first, so maybe next time when I'm painting with this method, I'll simply give it the good old try. Also, let me just say that a black brown or black wash is absolutely the best option for oxide red in my opinion, because it gives it that greasy, grimy look, which is exactly what I'm going for with this factory setting. Next up, we're gonna integrate the crap out of these decals. I made an oxide red mixture from oil paints and tried to match it as closely as possible to the base coat. You see, all these notes and funny quotes on the real vehicle were applied with chalk. And chalk won't leave a perfect line if the surface has some texture, right? So with the aid of speckling and some visual bamboozling, I made the decals look more translucent, as if the oxide primer was showing through. And if you use a slightly thicker, more opaque mixture for the speckling, which is exactly what I did in step 2, they'll receive some visible texture as well. 
as if the chalk skipped over the surface. I left this effect to fully dry overnight because I didn't want to accidentally reactivate it with the next step, which is blending white oil paint on top of it. This will give the markings a dusty look, just like a blackboard in a classroom. The same effect could be achieved with pigments or an airbrush, but I like oil paints because the effect is permanent and if we employ a bit of stippling, it'll look more authentic than the smooth airbrushed finish. Finally, I thought everything looked a bit too red for my taste and I also wanted to enhance that imperfect handwritten look. So I grabbed a pointy paintbrush, some diluted acrylic white and carefully went over each inscription. This can turn into a pretty tedious process, but it's well worth the time in my opinion. Besides, I took this opportunity and also added a few more spots of white that are not replicated in the decals, but visible in the reference images. Those were just two initial techniques that we applied and the model looks much more authentic. Depending on how clean you like your models, this might be a good place to call it good, but there's a lot more that we can observe in the reference images. But first, let's paint the details. I'm not adding any chipping to this model, although I do believe that some damage can happen even in the factory. Let's say the primed components were stored outside, or they were handled poorly. Stuff like that can happen, but no, this model will have no chipping whatsoever. I guess that no chipping challenge from my very first videos on YouTube is finally becoming a thing, eh? Well, the only exceptions are obviously a couple of these components which I decided to present in a raw steel finish to enhance that unpainted look of the tank and to give it some extra visual texture. The wheels were a mystery to me, if I'm honest. They're not too visible in the photos, so I can't tell if they were worn down or not, although some hints of wear are visible. Well, to make my life easier, I simply painted all the contact points in a rusty finish because leaving them untouched would probably make it look as if I had just forgotten about them. Of course, I painted some of the other small details as well, such as the tools on the engine deck, the antenna mount, the electric cables and the periscopes, but these were just all different shades of grey. The point is, the model is ready for weathering. Let's start with the tracks, because they're gonna have a huge impact on the whole picture. I treated them with VMS Black Track Pro, and it seems that the formula keeps improving each time, because it reacts with the metal immediately. Depending on the complexity of the tracks, it can have some problems getting into those tight places where air bubbles will form, but rubbing it with a stiff paintbrush, or even better, a toothpick solves the issue. After a thorough wash with soapy water and letting them fully dry, I applied a track wash from AK in those problematic areas, which completely covered up any hints of shiny metal. Now for the fun part, airbrushing with a rusty color. This is my diluted mixture of Tamiya paints and is the same one I've been using this year on the rail shunter and the Warhammer tank. The blackened surface on its own is pretty good, but I wanted a more punchy, vivid look. Not to mention how we can add contrast between individual links by spraying them in a more opaque layer of rust. It's a fun and very quick process. Speaking of quick processes, the final effect is a subtle hint of dust. Rust is a totally matte surface and as such will collect dust rather quickly. A dust magnet. My idea for this model was to apply the dust effects using acrylics and the tracks were the best starting point because they're so easy. Just a heavy wash and you're done. The other side can be more difficult because of all the tight spaces and high surface tension, but I found that pre-moistening the surface with clean water applied through an airbrush creates the perfect conditions for diluted acrylics. But let me show you the whole acrylic dust ordeal. In my beginnings, I used to work with a custom dust mixture made from Tamiya acrylics. I even made a video about how to mix them, but this time I wanted to make it much easier. I noticed how the new AK 3rd gen acrylics always dry to a completely flat finish and that makes them perfect for such tasks. As it turns out, you can mix your highly diluted dust mixtures directly on a wet palette, making the whole process less mechanical and more creative. The idea is to apply multiple layers and build the effect slowly. 
We can use pre-dusting with an airbrush to quickly add focal points with more dust, but I didn't find it necessary on this model. I also combined a yellowish sandy tone with a more desaturated dust tone for some extra variety, because oxide red contrasts nicely with both of them. So now we know that AK acrylics are also great for weathering, and because I'm partnered up with AK, you can get these and every other weathering product, tool, paint or 502 Uptide Long Oil Paint from them if you follow the affiliate link in the video description, and if you use my sales coupon, you'll also get a discount on your order. And you'll help me out with each purchase. On horizontal surfaces, we have to switch from straight brush strokes to stippling. I find these trickier because you pretty much have to keep stippling until the paint starts to dry, otherwise you'll get visible tide marks, but blowing air from your airbrush helps to speed up the process. So anyway, with the dust finished, we can put the tracks on the running gear and focus on the finishing touches which often have the biggest impact. And on this model, it's all gonna be about oil and grease stains. One might think that a factory fresh vehicle means the thing is squeaky clean, but the reference images show that the Ferdinand was filthy as f a lot. <laughs> Not only was it covered in dust, but we can spot several huge stains of oil and grease all over it, even on the running gear. This is what I meant when I was praising the blackish brown pin wash and how it works perfectly with oxide primer. This effect just builds up upon that foundation. It's hard to tell what this specific vehicle went through before it received the obligatory coat of dark yellow, and my German is almost non-existent so I can't decipher all the slogans on the tank, but from the little I managed to translate, it seems to me that this was the last Ferdinand ever built and ordered, and it was probably completed by the night shift crew. How poetic, right? <laughs> so, my theory is that the job was done before the night shift was over, and the factory workers had nothing else to do but just waste time. So they went to town and scribbled funny stuff all over the vehicle, and even added two ammo shells on the front, because why not? I don't know what's the story behind all the tree branches we see in the photos, but my guess is that the staff was just bored out of their minds, but who knows. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Once the grime was done, I just did two final touch-ups. The toolbox and wrenches were polished with a pencil, and once I thought the model was finished, I noticed an antenna in the reference image, so I made it from a 0.3mm copper wire and painted it grey. And with that, my mission was over. So, my friends, this model represents two things I wanted to do for a long time. A vehicle painted in oxide primer because it's such a cool foundation for weathering, and to finally comply with all of you who were challenging me in the comments to build a factory fresh tank. Well, of course, I would totally give a night shift spin on a freshly built Panzer Jaeger, and that's why I was so happy to observe how filthy this vehicle was. Next up, I'll make a small factory diorama for it, because it lacks a lot of context, and it'll be another challenge to capture a factory scene in a small area. I probably won't add the tree branches, because they just crank up the WTF factor to 11, and I also don't want to hide any of that sweet oxide red. I'm kinda bummed out though, because I always wanted to build a damaged Ferdinand from Kursk, with that sweet camouflage and countless impacts. But the most I can do now to keep up with the variety of subjects is an elephant. After all, I still have the 3D printed tracks for that, but don't worry, it won't happen anytime soon. Until then, I want to sincerely thank every single one of you for watching these videos, because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be building models for a living, and I can't thank you enough for this amazing opportunity. All of this is also possible thanks to my incredible patrons. My whole Patreon page is like a Night Shift magazine subscription, as I post there pretty often, and you'll get updates from my workbench where I share my thoughts and insights, we can get in touch through DMs, comments and emails, I'm posting one week early ad-free videos and those stay there forever, so you can always get back to them, I also have some small extra goodies such as 3D models which you can use for detailing your projects, a bunch of real life references for nature, 
old buildings and so on. And last but not least, these high resolution studio photos which show the model in more detail than video ever could. It will help me a lot, but no pressure. Anyway, as a night shift myself, I can deeply relate to this model and the factory workers who built it. I often feel bored out of my mind in the early hours of the morning and grabbing a chalk and writing all over the walls is oddly satisfying. But now I don't have time to be bored because I have a diorama to build. So until then be nice to one another, take care of each other, build your models, don't just collect them and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!